Penn State Wrestling defeats the number three Iowa Hawkeyes 29-6. to six. That's the number three team in the country, and they win by that kind of margin of 23 dual meet points. Kale Sanderson gets his 200th career victory as the Penn State Nittany Lions head coach. But that's not even the discussion at this point. Now it turns to, can this be the best college wrestling team in history? You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into a live edition of Locked On Nittany Lines. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Zach Seiko, bringing you all things Penn State sports coverage. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. And right now, new customers, when you join today, you'll get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more is a winner. It's that simple. All you got to do is go to fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. We welcome back Joe Smeltzer, special guest, Nittany Sports Now beat writer covering football, men's basketball, and wrestling. And there's a lot to recap here, Joe. Penn State, again, defeating Iowa in Carver Hawkeye 29-6. to That's the number three team in the country, and they absolutely decimated them. A little bit of history, a milestone accomplished. Kale Sanderson gets his 200th career victory at Penn State as Penn State's head coach and what a feat to do against this against Iowa and Penn State who the historical backgrounds continue to build up and I think that's fitting a fitting way to start off the show is is this the best Penn State team in history is this the best NCAA team in wrestling history there's a lot of comparing and contrasting to do but this team is going to have to accomplish a lot I think getting 10 All-Americans you definitely need at least five national champions. And then somehow you got to break that scoring record, the NCAA record set by the 1997, go figure, Iowa Hawkeyes led by Dan Gable of 170 points. I think they can do it, but we got to go through and see if they can check off all of those boxes. Joe, when you watch this team, they they pass the eye test for you, right? Of being the best team ever. At least maybe, and, and we still got to talk, what about the 2019 Penn State team? Right, they got to go up against that one too and see if they can even be the best team in Nittany Lion history. But I, I like this group's chances a lot. Yeah, 2019, 2017, another great one. Uh, mm -hmm. you gotta say there's at least a chance uh, that they end up uh, as the best college team ever. I think that's definitely a possibility when you, if you end up getting 10 All Americans, which is very right. possible, and at least. Um, I probably set the minimum at four national champions, but you probably want at least five in there. I think if both of those things happen, uh, you got you to gotta talk about it. Um, it's kind of hard to say now because to get a good gauge on this question, there's got to be like a really sort of deep dive, right? Just hours of research to see like how these guys stack up. You got to... Um, kind of uh do a lot but just from like a service value i think penn state has the second best coach of all time that should definitely factor in to the discussion they have two yeah. guys that are going to be likely four-time national champions which only a handful of guys have done before including said coach kale sanderson mm -hmm. uh and then you got to look at the gap between Penn State and the next best team, and that's got to be about as significant as a gap as there's been maybe of all time. Now, a lot of that, some of that is due to Penn State already having the reputation and people expecting Penn State to win it all because they've won it all so often. But a lot of that's mm -hmm. also due to the talent that this year's Penn State team has, and they have a chance to get 10 All-Americans I would say I'd be surprised that they don't have at least four national champions. Definitely a chance for more than that. And uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of talk about this um, over the next uh, month or so um, until NCAAs are wrapped up. But this team has definitely played itself 
at least into the discussion as the best of the Kale Sanderson era. And then if you're the best Kale Sanderson Penn State team, you got to be looked at as you got to be almost automatically inserted into the best ever debate because this is mm -hmm. next to Gables, Iowa. This this has to be the best stretch any program's ever had. So let's go through the, you said at least four national champions, and maybe we see where a fifth or a sixth can sneak in, okay? So I imagine yep. for that everybody that, let's talk about the obvious ones, Carter Starachi, Aaron Brooks, Greg Kirkfleet. Those are your three obvious ones. And then Bo Bartlett makes a huge statement. We're going to talk about more uh, of that one, but he has cemented himself as a number one wrestler. So now does that, who who are your guaranteed for then, or at least your your heavy favorites going into the NCAAs? Because those three, I, I would say, again, anything can happen in wrestling. I think we know that of, of all the sports out there, truly anything can happen in wrestling. But when I look at, I look at three locks, three serious heavy favorites. It's not that I don't think Bo Bartlett can do it, but I mean, it is very close in that 141 weight class, even though Bo Bartlett is out in front right now. So is he your fourth or Mitchell Messenbrink? Of course, Levi Haynes, right? I don't want to forget about Levi Haynes there. So then, okay, so let me put in your three locks that should, or your four locks that should come to mind. Haynes, Kirkley, Starachi, and Brooks. So therefore, that leaves a fifth and the sixth as does mess is mess and brink really that good i think he's established himself as a top three wrestler here at this point you don't you dominate i I'm dominant to an extent right but you had a clear gap between yourself and the number six wrestler at in your weight class so it, it's a matter of bartland mess and brink are they the ones that can they do it and put this penn state group over the top because those four seem pretty handy especially levi i mean levi haynes at, at 157 what he was able to do to a fellow top five wrestler in this one the the gap isn't even close yeah and, and we talked about uh levi haynes last week about the style mm -hmm. points weren't really there yet uh th that those questions were definitely answered tonight i mean shutting out a top five wrestler um i think it was a shutout uh and making him look like he didn't even want to be on the mat uh yeah. over three minutes of riding time i think it was that was just absolute domination and Levi Haynes, I think it's a clear favorite, and I think Bo Bartlett is a clear favorite. Penn State, um, I'll kind of take it uh, one step uh, further. They, I'm feeling pretty good about five national champions. I really am. And talking, uh, we, we've mentioned uh, Carter and Brooks, who are probably going to be four-time champs. Greg Kirkfleet yeah. finally has the mountain that was uh, Mason Paris out of the way. Nothing should mm -hmm. be stopping him. Now, uh, Bo Bartlett uh, has past the gauntlet of Jesse Mendez and Rial Woods over the past two weeks. And Levi Haynes is starting to look like he's starting to look like the guy we saw in March of last year. So um, those guys um, are doing their thing. I met Messenbrink. I was uh, not that uh, as a journalist, you're not supposed to have a rooting interest, but <laughs> for him to lose that major decision uh, in the last 15 seconds mm. or whatever it was, that, that was a little disappointing. Uh, yeah. But still, the, the guys had, I think, 10 major, uh, 10 bonus point victories out of his 14 matches coming into the night, 10 of 15 now, something like that. Yeah. Uh, that that's pretty good. And when you're wrestling a guy that was in the top six, um, they have no choice, uh, interim at Floyd, whatever, has no choice but to move Messenbrink up now. I, I don't know. I was surprised to see him stay at seven this week, uh, but he'll be up uh, at least in the six, maybe into the top five. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a guy uh, you mentioned top three. Um, I'd be surprised if he's not at least one of the two um, yep. wrestlers uh, on Saturday night uh, at 165. So we'll see what happens there. And another guy, I don't know if I'd put him into the national title discussion. How about the statement that Aaron Nagal made tonight? Um, yeah. You know, we talked about it before. He hadn't um, really uh, been up to par uh, in his bigger matches. Uh, and tonight... Granted, he was supposed to win when you're number six going against number 20, but the way he did it, uh, just an 11 uh shutout, um, that's pretty good. And doing that on the road, and that was after Brayden Davis' third tonight with a loss of 125. So not that Penn State needed that because um, they, they were going to beat Iowa pretty much no matter what, but that kind of set a tone for the rest of the night because after that, uh, Bartlett uh, gets his win over – Real Woods and 
it was really all Penn State from their uh, uh, case. I don't know why I blinked on Tyler Kasak's name, uh, but his yeah. uh, match didn't go the way he wanted, but still he was down 8-2, right. which is the sun victory. So positives to take away from the true freshman there. Uh, and then even though he lost tonight and let's face it, deserved to lose uh, last week, uh, we don't need to talk about uh, that anymore, but um. With how 125 has been this season uh, in the Big Ten, just a total yeah. uh, crapshoot. We saw it again tonight with yeah. uh, D'Agostino from Michigan getting upset. Um, I wouldn't completely roll out uh, Davis to make a run um, at 125. Just with how it's been and with what we saw last year, one of the biggest upsets, some would say the biggest upset in wrestling history, Spencer Lee losing to uh, Matt Ramos in the semifinals. Uh, yeah. Ramos is still there, and he's going to be the favorite until someone knocks him off. But 125 is really the Wild West in the Big Ten, and I wouldn't Absolutely. predict I wouldn't predict uh, Brian Davis to win a national title yet. I think he'll get there uh, by the time his career is over. But uh, he'll I think he'll be in the mix at 125. So um, that's I think Penn State has seven guys that are at least in the conversation uh, for a national title, and I think Aaron Nagal is. Gun, could play himself uh, into that uh, final four too. So, uh, yeah, it's it's looking really good. It's hard to talk about Penn State wrestling sometimes because it's like the same song and dance every mm -hmm. single week. Um, but come March, uh, you might see some things in that in those NCAA championships that you've never seen before from Penn State, and it's really exciting to think about. So your core four are Levi Haynes, Carter Storacci, Aaron Brooks, and Greg Kirkfleet. And I'm pretty sure the entire wrestling community is looking at it that way as well with a, a real serious chance. I, I wouldn't say that they they shouldn't necessarily be the odds on favor just because of how good and how close 141 and 165 are. Bo Bartlett cementing himself at number one. Mitchell Messenbrink definitely has got to be. He's making it to the semifinals. He is with one of the four yeah. best wrestlers at 165. But that class is insane. 165 might be the best class overall. And like you said, you don't know who you're going to get at 125. So Braden Davis might have lost tonight against Iowa, but that doesn't mean he couldn't. And freshmen, the younger wrestlers will just naturally get better as the season goes along. So we might see Braden Davis start to hit his peak in the middle of March. But And Aaron Nagal should be in the conversation as well as one of the four best at 133. So you have a lot of names. Now it's a matter of, okay, how many All-American wrestlers are they going to have? Because there's already been the speculation that Penn State could have a clean sweep at 10, and that is the record, getting all 10 of your wrestlers into the top eight. Tyler Kasak, you saw him lose tonight against Rachi, but that's, again, Rachi's really talented in his own right, and Kasak is still a, a true freshman at, at this point. So I, I don't want to say, oh, you know, uh, Joe, who's the weakest link here? but out of all the wrestlers, I think at 149, that is probably the one that's the furthest, like, I don't want to say the furthest away, but in terms of overall talent and how likely they are, the likelihood, who has the least likelihood of, of getting into the top eight, it would be Tyler Kasak at 149. Penn State realistically should expect to have nine All-Americans when all said and done this season. Yeah, and it really uh, kind of makes you think, uh, what if uh, Shane Van Ness didn't get hurt? Because that's mm. the guy who was an All-American last year and would have been a huge favorite to be an All-American this year and would have been yep. in the mix uh, for a national title. And as much promise as uh, Tyler uh, Kasek's shown uh, this season, uh, I don't think he's in the Final Four national title mix. I think he is in the All-American mix, um, but uh, – to say somebody's a weak link, I agree, Zach. Uh, that's uh, I know that we we that, can but... comparison, Joe, yeah. because everybody is so great in this lineup. But if I'm talking in terms of likelihood percentages, Tyler Kasak is, is in yeah. last by virtue of just everybody else is out in front. It's not because he's a bad wrestler. I mean, gosh, he's yeah. top ten as a freshman already, but we're talking top eight. I can he can he yes, but if we're talking about the least likely of the bunch. It is KSAC at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're a true freshman, uh, that, that all that says is that this Penn State team might be historically good. And mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be interesting to see what Penn State does uh, next season uh, with KSAC being a sophomore. Absolutely. But you also have 
Van Ness coming back, and uh, Kale's going to figure it out, but um, yeah. that's looking uh, way ahead. Uh, but, yeah, we're, the best ever um, debate, I think, if Van Ness had been healthy and living up to his expectations, mm. I think he was number two um, preseason, um, this team would have an even stronger case to be uh, the best of all time. Uh, but uh, the fact that they lost a guy who could have won a national championship and we're still having yeah. this talk, uh, that really – that says a lot about uh, what this program is. So then the last, the last piece of this puzzle, the piece of the pie, if you will, is the 170 point mark the NCAA the NCAA record set by the 1997 Iowa Hawkeyes and for Penn State uh, you can it, how how we're able to gauge that I mean it's going to take a lot of math do I like Penn State to do that if they're going to get at least right we're anticipating a lot like a guarantee we're anticipating heavy favorites for four national champions at a minimum like right right we're talking minimums here nine all Americans seriously. And then the way with with the sport adding the extra point on a takedown. So therefore, it's easier for guys like Carter Storacci and Aaron Brooks, who are and Mitchell Messenbrink, too, in this conversation that are already naturally gifted offensive attackers and technicians when it comes to that game who are just, you know, they're they're great on defense, but offensive game is just so completely different. It's that much better. They can rack up bonus points along the way. So that 170 point mark, when Penn State, that 2019 team had 157 and a half. So don't think that's like, well, that's the that's probably the most difficult proposition out of all the things, the national champions, the All-Americans getting to 10. I would say that reaching the 170 mark and surpassing it might end up being the easiest of the three to go down as one of the best teams, the best team in NCAA history. Yeah. Um and uh, I'm, I wouldn't call myself uh, an expert on, like, uh, the scoring uh, aspect uh, stats, of everything. Probabil- to, uh, stats and probability, Joe. <laughs> yeah, when, when when it comes to that. Uh, but, yeah, um, and it's, it's kind of hard to predict, like, what those things are going to be um, in March, um, just, like, yeah. uh, from, just uh, from that standpoint. But uh, you mentioned the style of wrestlers uh, that this team has. Uh, Messenbrink, mm-hmm. obviously, is an offensive guy. Carter Storacci, a big uh, offensive guy. Um, and if Levi Haynes continues to show what he showed uh, tonight and maybe a little less of what he was showing earlier with winning but yep. not really scoring as much, uh, maybe he's a guy that could get um, some more bonus points along the way. I think he has uh, eight bonus points win- wins now, uh, so that's mm-hmm. pretty good on his part too. But – uh, that that's a great point because not only does Penn State have very talented wrestlers, the styles of wrestlers Penn State has right. uh, kind of uh, bodes well um, for scoring. Uh, so uh, yeah, we can look at uh, the past teams, uh, how much they scored, um, and kind of uh, mm-hmm. kind of estimate uh, where Penn State's going to be. Um, but in uh, in these debates, uh, you got that's points overall points are something you have to look at and. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the personnel that Penn State has, um, I think I think it bodes well um, offensively in that department. And um, there's a lot of bonus points, um, not too many uh, takedowns uh, on the other side. So, yep, it's pretty good. It is a live Locked On Nittany Lines as we're recapping Penn State wrestling versus Iowa, but the conversation transcends just this match. I mean, again, the number three team in the country held to six dual meet points and the gap, just so a 23-point margin in favor of the Nittany Lions. So this truly has to compare it to past Penn State teams and then looking further looking further ahead. Now, I do want to go through some individual matchups, Joe, and talk about Levi Haynes' oh. domination. Again, uh, looking at Bo Bartlett, what he was able to do, along with some other things that we picked up on. That is coming up next here after the break. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. Happy Super Bowl Sunday to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We are so close to the big game, right? Super Bowl 58 is here. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, looking out for those awesome commercials, and then placing some super bets. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W, or two, or three, or maybe even more. 
Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. If you like me, I like the player props. So Patrick Mahomes passing yards, Christian McCaffrey rushing yards, and Travis Kelsey receiving yards are just a few of the things that you can wager on for the Super Bowl. And then you can craft them all together in a same game parlay. New customers, when you join today, you will get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more is a winner, it's that simple. It's that easy. All you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. And the Locked On Podcast Network is making history. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now you can also find it on Amazon Fire TV. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering each and every league. Find Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and now Amazon Fire TV. If you want to keep up with what Joe does outside of just wrestling, also covering football, and men's basketball, and so much more. That is at nittanysportsnow.com, and you can also follow Joe on X, formerly known as Twitter. Bo Bartlett with a statement win, somebody he lost to, I don't want to say convincingly, but Real Woods looked like he was in control of that match the last time they met, and it was 4-1, to one, and this time Bo Bartlett gets revenge, 4-2 to two in this case, and then there was Levi Haynes, Mitchell Messenbrink, just continuing to show, okay, you're doubting us, right? There, There's doubts around, and, and granted, and I will... I am not afraid to admit that I thought this one was going to be tough because Real Woods is, was coming off of an illness, a suspected illness that we heard about. He's still the reigning number one wrestler, even though he was you know, beat up in the match against Michigan. And, and that was somebody that you lost to, but now you exacted your revenge. So yes, I thought there was going to be that just that going into that matchup was going to be difficult. So let's start with Bo Bartlett, because I think that one was the most important because like we said, Levi Haynes. A lot or a heavy favorite going into the NCAAs. Carter Starachi, Aaron Brooks, Greg Kirkfleet. Those are your heavy favorites. But Bo Bartlett doesn't want to be counted out. And you said, as we were talking about this, I imagine that he's going to be your fifth just because he has now proven that he belongs in the conversation of there shouldn't be any more doubts that it's Real Woods or anybody else. Bo Bartlett has taken down Jesse Mendez and Real Woods in back to back weeks if that doesn't say you're the number one wrestler i don't know what does yeah uh you said it and uh it wasn't like at the jesse mendez match uh, where bo uh bartlett had mm -hmm. seven thousand whatever people cheering for him he was going into yep. carver hawkeye arena right. against the guy that um had been battling illness as you mentioned had uh mm -hmm. what was frankly a very almost shockingly poor showing the previous week but um, yep. Kind of uh, going into this match, I thought the law of averages uh, might uh, work against Bo Bartlett because you have uh, one guy is coming off a big win, another guy is coming off a big loss. And Real Woods, uh, you don't really picture him uh, losing two in a row, uh, right? No. And, you're and, thinking, and especially at home, right? Yeah. And you're thinking, okay, th this guy's going to be upset. He's going to be focused. He's going to be wrestling a guy he's beat. He's going to be. Uh, had the home crowd in his favor, um, as we mentioned. Uh, but Bo Bartlett really, uh, it wasn't a blow blowout or anything like that, but he controlled that match, um, yeah. for sure. And uh, to be able to have the biggest match of the night, uh, two weeks in a row and win both matches, mm -hmm. I think if Bo had won one of these matches, we would have been feeling pretty good about mm -hmm. him. That's how good Mendez and uh, Real Woods are, but. To go two and zero, uh, that's that's solid. That is beyond solid, and um, there's no doubt. Um, as good as one forty one is um, overall in the country, uh, there's no doubt who the top guy is at this point. And yeah. uh, we'll see kind of what happens um, at the Big Ten tournament. Uh, that's really the only way I could see Bartlett's momentum uh, being halted uh, between uh, now and NCAA's. But for now. Bo's the guy at 141 until he's not the guy, until somebody um, takes that from him. And what would I happen mm -hmm. before the NCAA championships or even at the NCAA championships? I wouldn't bet on it at this point. Yeah. And funny enough, you will, and it's going to be a, a rematch of somebody, Bo Bartlett versus, if this holds up too, based on the Big Ten seeding, right? We're going to see it again. 
whether it's and, and real woods. And I think the way the seating is because it's going to you're anticipating a two versus three real woods or Jesse Mendez got to eliminate one another. And that allows Bo Bartlett just to take care of business in the big 10 tournament. And then he'll face one of the two. I, I don't know what's gotten into. I don't want to say what's gotten into real woods because right. If you're, if you've had an illness, if, if we're going to hold that against real woods, then I don't want to be, cause I don't want to hold that against Aaron Nagal. Right. Aaron right. Nagal was rumored to be coming off of an illness as well and why he hasn't been wrestling up to his potential. Some people are questioning his ability. And that's why I thought it was key for him to get a victory like this one. A dominant one came out attacking right away. He's so good when he's on top, when he's riding. But then uh, the question marks have been around, you know, what is he like on his feet? And to, tonight against Iowa, Aaron Nagal had a complete, uh, had a complete match, a complete bout in this case. And I think that in, in against the appropriate competition, we saw that for the first time truly this season. Yeah, and uh, Nagal kind of had something similar last year um, at Minnesota. Uh, it wasn't mm -hmm. a smooth year for him. You could look at it and say, okay, this was a true freshman who uh, became an All-American, uh, wrestled RBY mm -hmm. tough twice. Um, yeah. And that tells you it was smooth sailing, but it wasn't. He had uh, issues. um with injury, uh, and then um, it was around February where he caught fire, and no. his first match of February, um, even though he lost um, last Friday, there were some good things there. He scored double-digit points. There was some right. good offense, and uh, tonight uh, we saw that offense, uh, but he wasn't giving – he literally gave nothing on the defensive end. He pitched a shutout, uh, the use of baseball term, and mm -hmm. – uh, We've seen it uh, with guys, as uh, Zach, you mentioned, uh, young wrestlers in particular, kind of, this is their time, right? Uh, right around now is when mm -hmm. they start to get hot. Uh, Nagal is yep. still a young wrestler, only in year two. Uh, we saw with Levi Haynes uh, last season uh, getting all the way uh, to the national championship. Uh, yep. Maybe if he wasn't wrestling a guy that was 40 years old in North Carolina is also no He wasn't 40, he was 24, but... Uh, maybe if he wasn't wrestling uh, a, a guy that experienced, he would have won a national championship. But nonetheless, um, Nagal could be a player uh, come Big Tens uh, mm -hmm. and uh, NCAAs. He's already – he has the experience, too, of wrestling uh, the number one guy both last year, Roman Barber Young, twice, and this year, Ryan Crookham from Lehigh. He is the man to beat nationally at that weight class right now. And Nagal wrestled him. That was his first bout of the season uh so this guy is battle tested um and i think uh he'll he'll be a player uh come uh big 10 championship time man we'll see what he does for the rest of this uh, dual meet season as well but if tonight's any indication uh this guy is hitting his stride and that's just more uh am ammo for penn state if that's indeed the case Let's circle around to Levi Haynes at 157. And I, I thought it was important to throw Aaron Nagal in there just because he's, he's close to that 141 class. And, and, and his bout was important. But Levi Haynes, kind of the same thing. He hasn't been dominating in terms of the scoreboard, right? He just continues to survive in advance, survive in advance, protect that number one spot. And I think that's where Levi Haynes' game has changed this season because we discussed that the last time you and I did a show together, Joe, is the fact that Levi Haynes has now something to protect rather than to prove. But then there's still question marks of, okay, how dominant is he? Is he truly a number one or can he be upset at any given point in time? People looked at me crazy and, and were in the comment section saying, Zach, how can you guarantee a Levi Haynes victory when Frannick is in the top five? You saw the dual meet. You all watched the dual meet. That right there is why I thought, because Levi Haynes, again, saving things. You don't have to show it all against the unranked wrestlers. You get take care of business, win the way you need to, and advance. People got to remember that this is a season long type of thing, but for Levi Haynes, complete match, complete, complete bout against Frannick. And that was a top five wrestler, a sixth year senior. And Levi Haynes did that. Imagine Joe, imagine telling, and I'm not saying that Iowa basically told him to concede, but imagine that the conversation was like, Hey, look, don't give up bonus points or be careful of giving up bonus points here. That is how good Levi Haynes is. The fact that he did that to a top five, sixth-year senior wrestler in his weight class. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest compliment, Zach, you can pay to a wrestler for his performance during a given match is 
making the other guy look like he didn't want to be there. Um, yeah. I saw that with uh, Messenbrink um, at Michigan, uh, and I saw that with Levi Hanks tonight, and I'm sure there's been multiple other – there's been many instances uh, of that with Penn State wrestling this season, but mm-hmm. those are two uh, that uh, jump out uh, to me right away. And for Anik, it looked like he didn't want to be there. He got called yeah. for a stall. Um, it seemed like – uh, Haynes had most of the match. He had riding time. He just, he got an early takedown. I got that riding time and just wouldn't get it up. There was no, there was no escape. Um, and, uh, for, for Frannick, uh, to, uh, be just that defeated, uh, in a top mm-hmm. five matchup in front of his home audience. Uh, that, that was like, that was like a mercy rule type of deal um in a high school football game that's what it felt like and mm. uh it was just um the timing was perfect for levi haynes because i don't think we were the only two people talking about um how uh he wasn't uh he was winning but not dominating well yeah. tonight he won and he dominated and i'm pretty sure that that's got to be the highest ranked guy he has faced at this point uh this season yep. Um, I mean, he's had some so, good competition at this yeah. point, but like you said, yeah, a, a pure top five matchup between, but that's how large the gap is. I, I I mean this when I say it. Levi Haynes looks unbeatable, and now that this class has gone through some changes, again, guys graduate and everything, right? They move on, and so this is this is Levi Haynes' weight class to lose. But Joe, to do that against a number five wrestler, yeah. he looks unbeatable because he's great on his feet, and then defensively, he just doesn't let you do anything. He does not let you do anything. So if Haynes is going to, Haynes can almost do whatever he wants. I feel like he has been holding back, not intentionally, right? But you, again, it's chess, not checkers. Do what you need to do to win. You don't need to prove anything to me. If you get a major decision against an unranked wrestler versus a attack ball, I, I'm not, it, so it's 11 to nothing instead of uh, 15 to nothing. I'm not going to sit and say, well, you know, Levi Haynes. But in, in this case, he just came out there and broke Frannick down. And that's why he's the number one wrestler in this class. But I, I think he is truly unbeatable at, at this point. And with everything goes, he should feel like one of the more secure ones to win a national title. Yeah, and it really makes me think of uh, something uh, Bo Bartlett said a few weeks ago. I think we talked about mm-hmm. this quote last week. But when Penn State wrestles, especially on the road, it's very easy to fall into a trap because Penn State can look at any match just as another match. but. Other any any other wrestling team doesn't look at it that way. Uh, this is going to be Iowa's biggest home meet of the season. It's any team's yeah. biggest home meet when Penn State's on the road. Um, so Bo was saying that he had struggled with this season, kind of forgetting that while it might be another match to him, the other guy, that's their Super Bowl. And Levi Haynes is the top guy. He was the guy in the finals last season. The other finalist is not there anymore. Everybody yeah. at uh 157 and in college wrestling knows he's the top guy um in that weight class, and Frannick knew it too. So this should have been um the biggest meet of the year uh for Frannick at this point. Because if you beat this guy, uh now people are looking at you as this guy could be a national champion, but instead of that, uh it was an absolute slaughter. I saw no yeah. sense of urgency at all in Levi Haynes made it that way. I don't think yep. um, that had anything to do with uh, him having the right wrong mindset coming into the match. I just think Levi got that takedown, got on top of him, and you know that was that was it. It was just that that was uh, to use the USC term. If we were given performances of the night uh, for college wrestling dual meets, that would have been the performance of the night. And then I think we should. Look at 165 again, Mitchell Mess and Brink, because again, it's like, oh, well, he's top 10. And, and Penn State wrestling fans continue to hype him up and say, no, he's in the top four. We've been saying he's at least top four uh, on the show, a top three, top four, however you want to frame it. He, get, he's getting to the semifinals here, but defeating again. And, and like you said, a little disappointed to see that he wasn't able to secure that major decision uh, against Mikey Caliendo. But there was a clear distance between himself and the number six wrestler at that weight class. Mikey Caliendo is very, very good. And Mitchell Messenbrink, because of how aggressive he is, and I like what the announcers said about this too, the Big Ten announcers. They said that Mitchell Messenbrink is essentially going to throw a wrench into the 165 competition just because 
he is so aggressive and so offensively sound that it's just going to be a little bit of a change up here at 165 for a majority of the class. I feel like, again, Egan O'Toole and David Carr can adjust to that. But for the rest of the weight class, you see it throws off a Mikey Caliendo. It's like, holy smokes, he's he's a maniac. He's an animal out here. Yeah, as far as NCAA goes, it's really hard when the two guys you mentioned, those are two guys that are as good at pound for pound as anybody out there. So yeah. uh, that, that makes it difficult for everybody else. Uh, but yeah, th this guy um, is already so good and he just keeps getting better. Um, yeah. That's the scary part, uh, right? Here's the guy that came in to Penn State basically as a true freshman. He was a redshirt freshman, but had two college matches under his belt. And I think those were both unattached. Um, I could be wrong on that, but he, in mm -hmm. any case, he only had two matches. Um, yep. to go off of, uh, so, uh, you know, you wrestle a guy that is experienced uh, in Caliendo, uh, in yep. his home building, and you wouldn't know that Messenbrink was the less experienced one, uh, by watching the match. He was toying with him at times, and it, um, really should have been a major, uh, kind of, uh, let one slip, um, in the last 15 seconds, uh, I won't harp on that anymore, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Carr or O'Toole, uh, one of those guys is the man to beat um, at 165. Uh, they're, they're both just mm -hmm. so good. Uh, but um, I'm expecting to see Messenbrink uh, in that final four. And with how good, uh, how much better he could get uh, in another month, think of how much better he looks uh, from the Oregon State meet until now. Um, if he keeps uh, making uh, that improvement and he ends up uh, having to mix it up uh, with one of those two uh, Big 12 guys, um, who knows what could happen, but hopefully he gets that opportunity because wrestling one of those two, regardless of the outcome is going to be huge uh, for his uh, development, uh, going forward into next season. Cause he's a guy that Pence has got NCAA is going to be seeing a lot of the 165 uh, for the next few years. Absolutely. He's only a redshirt freshman first year at Penn State after transferring in. Carter Storacci gets a major decision against Patrick Kennedy, 13 to 5. Bernie Truax, an 8 to nothing shutout at 184. And, and Bernie Truax, a good way to bounce back after getting pinned the way he did against Ohio State. Aaron Brooks, number one wrestler, looked, uh, looked a little bit human because I thought he was going to get a major decision. That's just how good Aaron Brooks is. But Zach Glazier, who was undefeated to this point, uh, held his own just outside of the top 10. So that was good to see. And then Greg Kirkfleet picks up a, a major decision of his own later on in the in the bout too he did it was pretty close to start and then was able to secure it uh later on here anything that stood out to you kind of we go a little more rapid fire between those four matches there's just not a lot to take over. i thought starachi i thought kennedy tired out starachi a little bit but again just so and the same thing with brooks they're so good defensively that even when there is a good shot they're always able to counter even when it looks like they're going to get to i mean carter starachi has not been taken that had not been taken down to this point. Yeah. Uh, I thought Sirachi uh, looked better uh, than he did uh, last week um, against better competition. Yeah. Uh, but aside aside from that, uh, I mean, th those guys are the heavy favorites uh, to win a national championship. Uh, and then the fourth guy, Bernie Truex, uh, he was wrestling. Uh, we, didn't mention him. we didn't mention him enough. He's sixth. He's sixth. He could, he could at 184 at least, you know, I, again, I would kind of group him in with closer to KSAC in terms of probability. If we're talking probability, who would make it into the All-American and then getting to the semifinals national championship, Bernie Truax. But just again, just because the talent's so good. But let's not forget that Truax has been around college wrestling for a long time and he's a veteran. So he very well could. At what, but 184 is a really good class too. 184 yeah. is very good. And people are going to talk about uh, Truex getting pinned by an unranked guy. Uh, that mm -hmm. pin, uh, I don't want to call it a fluke uh, because mm -hmm. uh, he he got the pin fair and square. But Truex was up, I think, 9-4, 9-3 at that point. So it wasn't like he was just getting handled the whole way and then the pin was the icing yeah. on the cake. It was just um, a few bad seconds. Uh, but, um, yeah, Truex uh, – Kind of take tonight with a grain of salt because with all due respect uh, to his opponent, uh, you're going against the guy that came in 10 and 10 and now is 10 and 11. That's yeah. uh, hard to prove too much uh, there. But uh, I, I said after the Ohio State meet uh, that there's nothing to worry about with this guy. He's Penn State's guy yeah. at 184. Um, eventually, that's going to be Josh Barr, uh, yeah. but not 
Um, so, uh, but yeah, as an all American guy, there's no reason uh, to think that he wouldn't be an all American. He's already uh, done it before. Mm -hmm. Um, at, Different weight classes, right? 197 beat Max Dean uh, last mm -hmm. season. That's a national champion. So, uh, yeah, Bernie Truex is um, a guy that kind of gets uh, lost in the shuffle. But hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, for his sake, he makes everybody uh, forget about uh, that pin because I don't think the pin was a reflection of yep. what Bernie Truex is as a wrestler. I just think he got caught and it happens sometimes. Get it out of your system now. You'd, I'd rather see him get pinned now than as opposed to the Big Ten tournament or the NCAA tournament. And we didn't we didn't get the chance to see Gabe Arnold. And everyone, there was speculation, yeah, oh, is Gabe Arnold going to wrestle at 174, 184? And then if you watched this show, if you watched this preview, if you watched the preview of this dual meet, Jeff Byers was all clued in, a voice of Penn State Wrestling, and said, no, uh, I was probably going to redshirt him, so we won't see him out in this because I was – Carter Storacci versus Gabe Arnold, a chance for Storacci to make him eat those words, saying that he's a high school senior, saying that Carter Storacci, a multinational <laughs> champion, is overrated, is bold talk, is bold talk. But we didn't get to see it, but Iowa's playing a little bit of it's play, is investing long term in this case. Uh, and they probably would have wrestled him at 184 just because it, they probably would have wrestled him there if they did, but looks like they have ulterior plans for him. Joe, just. We'll we'll put a bow tie on it. We'll we'll re we'll look forward now as Penn State has the Bryce Jordan dual Bryce Jordan Center dual meet against Rutgers on a Monday. Okay, uh, that's when it's <laughs> this upcoming Monday here. But then Nebraska, we're going to talk about why Nebraska might be the toughest dual meet of the season. Not Iowa, not Michigan, not Ohio State. The Cornhuskers. We'll discuss that here on the other side. And if you're not already becoming every day or subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lines on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts for the latest analysis, conversations around your favorite Penn State sports, truly all of them, Penn State football, football recruiting, men's basketball, men's hockey, and wrestling. In this final say, and remember, you can keep up with Joe Smeltzer at NittanySportsNow.com and also on X, formerly known as Twitter. In this final segment, looking ahead for Penn State, I mean, this is going to be tough. They got to turn around and they got to wrestle that Bryce Jordan Center dual meet against Rutgers, who they they should have no problem against. And I feel like maybe you might not see all of the starters for Penn State in this one. Rutgers just a, a bit barely on the inside of the top 15, and we've seen what Penn State has done to other teams. I'm a little more concerned about Nebraska, but Joe, I think you have to pay attention to wrestling a tough duel. you got to travel, right? You traveled to Iowa. You wrestled the number three team in the country. Regardless of the result, you're still going to be tired and fatigued from that and you got to turn around in less than 72 hours and go to the, the highest profile home dual meet of the season in the Bryce Jordan Center against a Rutgers team that, yeah, they're not going to be, <laughs> they're going to be a serious underdog here, but that's more of the chip on their shoulder. So they're going to, Scarlet Knights are going to try to come out and give Penn State a, runs, a run for its money. Yeah, uh, I'm interested to see um, what Rutgers does because Rutgers kind of gets lost in the shuffle um, among these Big Ten teams, so, which is kind of crazy since. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if there's a top 15 team in football, uh, they're fond of us a force to be reckoned with, uh, but wrestling, if you're outside that top 10, uh, right. especially in the nation's best conference, you kind of get forgotten about, but, yeah. uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect to see the entire A team out there for Penn state, uh, Monday. Um, I don't know. I uh, just kind of spitballing. Maybe we see Josh Barr, um, at 184. I think he can still wrestle right. him and save his red shirt. Um, so that might be, uh, something we see. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll actually be there, uh, for my first, uh, dual meet, um, experience. I was at the big 10 yeah. championship last season. So, um, I know, uh, the experience of covering college wrestling a little bit, but, um, a dual meet, uh, with, uh, the Penn state crowd, I'm at the Bryce Jordan center. I'm expecting, uh, you think it still sells out, um, even though it's a weeknight, probably. Well, yes, simply because. I feel like Pennsylvania is the mecca when it comes to wrestling and wrestling fans. I mean, this Pennsylvania just kind of like football, where like Texas and Florida and California, Pennsylvania is truly where all of the best wrestlers come from, and that's what we're going to discuss more of with with Nebraska. We saw how many Pennsylvania top Pennsylvania wrestlers in high school go to Ohio State because there was no room at Penn State. So yeah, Pennsylvania residents 
like they're wrestling. And, and there are a lot of Penn State fans around this region. So I, I think the Bryce Jordan Center should still be. And, and how, again, how often does this happen, Joe? How often do you yep. get this kind of max capacity opportunity? Despite the opponent, despite the weeknight, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I do think it will still be a, a sellout crowd. Yeah, um, I'm hoping so. Uh, yep. I, obviously, um, it, it would be better, right, if we had um, an Iowa or a Michigan or even a Nebraska. Nebraska, which the, I think Nebraska is the second best team in the Big Ten, and uh, we're going to yep. talk about that. It's looking like it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's still uh, it's still going to be um, a unique thing, and you still get to see um, maybe as we've been talking about a historically good team wrestle in front of uh, about twelve thousand uh, plus right. people instead of uh, the seven thousand that it usually does. Um, that's pretty neat stuff, uh, and um, I don't I don't really know what to expect because I never covered a Penn State uh, dual meet, uh, but I'm excited for it. Yeah, yeah, that in-person experience will definitely be. I mean, the Bryce the Bryce Jordan Center meet as always. It's nothing to. It's something to look forward to every single time. However, I just wish it was Nebraska. Nebraska, and, and why I say this more now. This was something that Jeff Byers, the voice of Penn State wrestling, and has been a frequent guest on the show, put in my ear. He said, out of all the teams that they face this season, Nebraska matches up the best in terms of head-to-head -head bouts with Penn State. And let's go over what they did to Michigan just before the Big Ten Network had the doubleheader. And then Michigan, who, who beat Iowa handedly, and Penn State beat Michigan handedly, but Nebraska beat Michigan handedly as well. They won 8 out of 10. The only winners for Michigan were Shane Griffith at 174 and Lucas Davison at 285. But I got to admit, uh, and, and like you said, second best team in the Big Ten. And right now, according to Intermat, Nebraska is ranked fourth. But I got to imagine they'll move up to third. Oklahoma State is, uh, I think they're solidified at number two here. But Nebraska has been accumulating its own Pennsylvania talent. These are some names that I recognize. Jacob Van D saw him wrestle in the Pennsylvania high school ranks, and he is extremely talented. Lenny Pinto as well. Lenny Pinto was very talented going up through and then de dealt with some injuries, ended up going to Nebraska. Now he's number three at, at 184. Don't forget about Peyton Robb. Peyton Robb's been around for quite some time now in college wrestling, but he's, he's uh, and that's when Levi Haynes really truly started to emerge last season, whether it was those matches against Peyton Robb. They still have Silas Allred. And then at 149, they have the number one wrestler in Ridge. Love it. So, like I said, and like Jeff Byers said, I can't, I can't take credit for this, but I completely agree with him. This might be the closest dual meet opponent that Penn State, this is going to be the closest dual meet that Penn State's going to have. I would not be surprised if this is within single digits. Yeah. Uh, and it, there's great individual matchups, uh, too. Obviously, you mm -hmm. mentioned Levi Haynes against Payton Robb. Uh, yep. Last season, that was Haynes' coming out party. The Big Ten Championship match, uh, we're coming in thinking, okay, uh, this kid's had a great run. Um, yep. He has a bright future ahead of him. Uh, but Payne Robb is the number one guy in the country. Uh, so uh, we weren't expecting Levi Haynes. And I think Levi Haynes, even judging by his post-match interview, surprised himself a little bit by getting that win. And not only getting the win, doing so in exciting fashion, getting a – getting that uh, takedown, I think it wasn't some sudden victory. Then the two end up wrestling again uh, at uh, the NCAA championships, and Haynes does it again. But uh, that'll be one to watch um, with the roles being reversed. Now Levi Haynes is the big-time favorite over Payton yep. Robb, who's really hard to root against because of all he's gone through, uh, almost right. losing right. a lot more than his wrestling career um, over the spring. In fact, right at the NCAA championships. Uh, was when uh, right. when he had uh, that illness. So thankfully, uh, he's mm -hmm. back on the mat from. Uh, but elsewhere, uh, we're going to find out a lot about uh, Tyler Kasich because he's going up. He'll be going mm -hmm. up against the man at uh, 149 in Ridge Lovett. Uh, he's awesome. And I think uh, Bo Bartlett might have another uh, match of the day um, going up against Brock Hardy, who – Hardy beat Bartlett, right, at the Big Ten Championships uh, last season. Nebraska had a really good showing overall on that, the Big Ten Championships. Uh, Allred yeah. um, is great, too. You mentioned him. And then at 125, uh, we talked about um, how kind of weird 125 is, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Just 
pretty much a crowd shoot, and it's all in the Big Ten. But Brain Davis is going to have um, his hands full again against Caleb Smith, who set the tone for that dual meet we talked about against Absolutely. Michigan tonight uh, by beating uh, Mikey D'Augustino you know, in yep. in exciting fashion in the first bout of the night. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Nebraska's pretty loaded. Uh, I think Nebraska's better than Iowa, and Nebraska proved itself mm-hmm. to be better uh, – than Michigan. Uh, I don't. Does Nebraska wrestle Ohio State this season? Uh, I don't know if it does. But uh, yeah, I'd have to. We'd have to double check on that a, a, as well. But looking, looking at this Penn State Nebraska yeah. dual meet at one twenty five, you're getting a top fifteen matchup, maybe even a top ten, depending on where Caleb Smith ranks after defeating a number sixty Augustino Jacob Van D. I imagine with defeating Ragason, who was top four, is probably yep. going to move into the top fifteen spot. Brock Hardy could be top five. At 141, Ridge Love, it's not going to move. He's number one. Peyton Robb maybe could move back into the top five uh, as well. So if you're looking at the first half, you're uh, top 10, top five, top 10, top five, right? And then at 165, a top 15 matchup potentially, 174. That's It depends where they rank. Bubba Wilson, he's kind of on the really further on the outside, but 174 should be uh, Carter Starachi, a uh, tech ball, maybe even a pin, right? Uh, but then at 184, you were potentially getting a top five matchup if they move true acts back inside the top five and then potentially a top 10 top 15 matchup with silas all uh, silas all at 197 and then heavyweight is going to be greg kirkley versus an unranked but at eight of the weight classes you are getting at a minimum top 15 matchups top 10 matchups across the board between penn state and nebraska and, and it's fitting that That is going to be the last Big Ten dual meet for Penn State of the season. That one's on February 18th. That's a Sunday, and it's at 4 p.m. in Rec Hall. So I'm glad that it's a home dual meet for them and a great way to finish up the season. They have Edinburgh. Edinburgh, That's a tune-up before the Big Ten championships. But what a way to round out Big Ten conference dual meet action. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Penn State. uh, This is looking a little ahead, but having Edinburgh as a tune-up Meanwhile, Iowa wrestles Oklahoma State in its last uh, oh, dual meet. Oh, good for them. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. And Tom Brins, is, he's great, right? Uh, people don't like the Brins brothers. I think pretty much every fan that isn't an Iowa fan doesn't like Tom and especially Terry Brins. But uh, they're, they're great at what they do. And without this Penn State dynasty that Kill Sanderson has built, who knows how many national titles uh, Tom Brins would have. But Iowa does this, I think, every year. Uh, for whatever reason, they like to end the uh, regular season Go facing the powerhouse. And I just don't – I don't understand it. Uh, it just – there's too much risk too much risk involved uh, before Big Ten championships. And if things really go awry, that could uh, kind of offset things going into the NCAA championships. So um, mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think that's kept Iowa from – overtaking Penn State or anything like that. I, I just think it's a very weird strategy because that's that's a dual meet you'd like to see in December, early January, kind of like Penn State had Oregon State uh, about the middle of January. But to have that type of meet um, at the end of the season, uh, I, I'll, I'll have to look it up to see if Tom Brands has explained it anywhere. I'm sure he has. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure he is smarter than – in fact, I know he's smarter than I am when it comes to wrestling, but – from the outside, I do not understand uh, why Iowa does does it that way. I just don't. In Penn State's case, now Iowa can wrestle whoever it wants. Kale Sanderson has picked up now 200 victories as the Nittany Lions head coach. What what a career! Uh, obviously, you know, I, I I can only you know what is left to be said about what he did as a collegiate wrestler and then an international competitor and then to get into coaching go back to his alma mater, Iowa State, and then take a chance at Penn State and take over as the next head coach and and become and building, creating this dynasty that is arguably the best program in all of sports history. Ten national titles out of the last dozen have gone to Cale Sanderson and Penn State. And he's had, in, in such a short time, 200 victories uh, in Happy Valley. So, wow. I, I mean, what... What a job Kale Sanderson's done, but words can only explain so much, Joe, of just how successful. And they make it, they make it look so easy. People have said to me that Penn State wrestling is boring because all they do is win. Nobody challenges them. They just continue, they continue to distance themselves from the rest of the pack. 
29 to six against the number three team in the country on the road. I mean, it, it, it almost felt too easy and, and what a way to do it for your 200th victory. One of the funniest things, uh, Zach, uh, that I tell people all the time is two of the greatest wrestlers in the history of the sport wrestled at Iowa state became mm -hmm. two of the greatest coaches ever in the history of the sport at places that weren't Iowa state. And, and one of them became, <laughs> became the best ever at Iowa state's rival, Iowa. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other one coached at Iowa state and then left Iowa state. So yeah. Left the uh, that's, so that's uh that's something that Cyclones fans I'm sure think that's one of the great what ifs, right? Because Kale mm -hmm. and Audrey Snyder wrote a great uh profile um on this uh feature on this for the athletic last spring um that I'd recommend anybody reading that subscribes. But uh mm -hmm. Kale came very close to staying at Iowa State, and if that happens, who knows what the history uh, of wrestling looks like? Because it would all all the dominance would be in the state of Iowa. But uh, luckily for Penn State and its fans, uh, Penn State was able to get Kale. Uh, Kale called Penn State's program a sleeping giant, and the giant woke up, and now everybody else is the one sleeping. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just. Uh, Hard to put in the words of what Kale has done. Hard to say anything about Kale that hasn't been said already. But yep. um, that's just one thing that I think about a lot is how does Iowa State have two of the best wrestlers ever to get in the coaching, become two of the greatest yeah. ever at coaching, and not have any of them build their coaching legacies at Iowa State? That's just that, – that, that's, pre that's pretty tough uh, if you're an Iowa State fan. And State fans, be happy that you have Kale Sanderson as the wrestling head coach. Again, 200th career victory here, defeating Iowa 29 to six, and, and recapping it all in close to an hour's time here. Joe, I, I really appreciate the time. I really do. Almost 60 minutes we spend together talking on the show about Penn State wrestling, but enjoyable. Penn State's got Rutgers on Monday in the Bryce Jordan Center, and then su the following Sunday against Nebraska. That one's going to be a fun one as we'll keep following it, we'll keep covering it. You can keep up with what Joe does over at NittanySportsNow.com. That is NittanySportsNow.com for the latest on the beat for football, men's basketball, wrestling, and so much more. NittanySportsNow.com, also on X, formerly known as Twitter. If you like what we talk about here on Locked on Nittany Lines, subscribe to the YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcast for the latest conversations around your favorite Penn State sports, truly. Football, football recruiting, men's basketball, men's hockey, wrestling, all of it is right here on Locked on Nittany Lines. Joe, thanks again for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for everyone tuning in to the live show. And and Joe, can't wait to do this again in the not-too-distant future. Penn State still has more to come with the remainder of the regular season, Big Ten Championships, and NCAAs. Yep, absolutely. Thanks as always.